In Hollywood, California, a tribute was held at the American Film Institute for a special group of filmmakers. Filmmakers whose credits never appeared on the big screen. They were a team of photographers, producers, and technicians who put together hundreds of classified films for the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. Their jobs were shrouded in secrecy. The atomic bomb blasts they filmed were a matter of national security. Now, 50 years after the opening of their secret film studio, their story can be told. Operation Crossroads was the first series of atomic tests following World War II in 1946. Because of the lack of adequate photography during the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the U.S. government placed high priority on motion picture and still photography to record future atomic and nuclear tests. Virtually every type of camera available in 1946 was employed on Operation Crossroads. 19 Army Air Force planes and 17 naval aircraft provided camera support for Crossroads, unlike any the world had ever seen up to this point. Eight F-13s and two C-54s were modified for the job. Each F-13 carried 38 cameras and each C-54 carried 32 cameras. The cameras were positioned in fixed ground locations and in aircraft. In the air, camera platforms consisted of aircraft orbiting the target fleet at speeds as high as 300 miles per hour. More than 1,500,000 feet of motion picture film and over 1 million still pictures were exposed during Operation Crossroads. Field laboratories were set up at the Army Air Base on nearby islands to process the massive amounts of film footage. Crossroads became a landmark in photographing atomic weapons tests. Well, I was originally hired as a film editor on Operation Crossroads, which was before Lookout Mountain. That was the Abel and Baker shots in the Pacific. And then there was a two-year gap there, and then they started this second series of tests. And I heard about it, and I asked if I could go back to work for them, and they said yes. So like in a typical military fashion, they sent me to MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida, while all the time they were getting ready to build this place, take over this place in Laurel Canyon. So about a month later, after being in Florida, they sent me back here to Hollywood, and uh, I lived just a few miles away. I lived on Gardner Street in Hollywood, and. Uh, you know, I went up there, this strange place at 8935 Wonderland Avenue, and uh, I was employed already, and they, you know, they said, you know, bring a hammer and pliers and screwdrivers because we're building and remodeling this place. The officer who started Lookout Mountain went to SC Cinema School with eight other guys, and he took them all up and started Lookout Mountain. And they worked on crossroads and sandstone before I ever got there. And then I worked on the very next test was called Greenhouse in 50, in the spring of 51. Well, uh, look how mountain, we were located up uh, Wonderland Avenue and the neighbors thought we were building atomic bombs there. And so they were all suspicious of what we're doing because they would come and go at all times of the hours and strange looking vehicles. <laughs> Lookout Mountain Air Force Station, a photographic installation of the Aerospace Audiovisual Service, Military Airlift Command, and home of the 1352nd Photographic Group, containing facilities to accomplish all phases of photography.
staffed by both civilian and military filmmakers of the United States Air Force. The administrative function is housed in a portion of this modern building in the San Fernando Valley, a 15-minute courier drive from the main gate. The organization's mission, photographic documentation of Air Force activities, the production of scientific films, technical films, training films, informational motion pictures, or the Atomic Energy Commission, for joint Army and Air Force exercises, for civil defense, for the Air Force, as well as other government agencies. Lookout Mountain's facilities included a full stage, two screening rooms, processing of 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter motion picture film, optical printing capabilities, a still photography lab, animation department, an editorial department, extensive film vaults, and support facilities. The laboratory was required to conceptualize projects, research and write the scripts, photograph, process and edit the films, score the music, and provide final release printing. All personnel of the lab were queue cleared for access to top secret restricted data. The location of the studio in Hollywood gave its personnel ample opportunity to test new photographic equipment and techniques. They always made what they called a commander's report that was shown to Congress, and that's how they got the appropriations for future tests and, and for the programs that uh, made the scientific uh, discoveries and, the, and the, what happened to weapons and different things like that. Lookout Mountain was charged with uh, photographing all the uh, nuclear weapons tests in Nevada and, and we talk in Bikini on film for documentary purposes. We documented every scientific program and every military program for the effects that were created by the weapon going off. But the excellence of a photographic record depends upon the production facilities behind it. That is why Lookout Mountain Laboratory had been established at Hollywood, California, close to the labor market of skilled personnel and yet satisfying all security requirements. This modern motion picture laboratory had been set up by the Air Force to serve the needs of the Atomic Energy Commission. At that time, they didn't have a lab yet. The film went to the labs in Hollywood to be developed, but it was the labs in Hollywood had security channels that were approved by the armed forces so they could handle the stuff. Security was important too, and careful accounting had to be made of all film at the same instant that the photo crews were being congratulated for the success of the missions and the excellence of the photography. The top secret natures, if when you photographed any weapon or test device, so that would reveal the size of it, the shape, the weight, or the construction of it. That was always top secret. Security rules are followed and records kept on all film issued or received. For stored in this vault are thousands of cans of irreplaceable and classified film. Millions of feet documenting the atomic energy program as well as Air Force footage, currently being produced at Lookout Mountain. Small wonder, nothing is left to chance. The doors are often firmly locked guarding those men and women who, like these negative cutters, must handle this film in their daily work. I guess it was important. I guess, you know, it's a need to know. and uh, It didn't need to be declassified. It was going forward under, under controls of, of classified restrictions. And uh, if you needed to know something, you, you got to know it. Everybody at Lookout Mountain had a top secret clearance, and everybody had a... Uh, a Q clearance for the Atomic Energy Commission. 
But there were lots of things that, you know, projects that I wasn't working on that I didn't know really what it was all about. For a few years, four or five years, that we thought, you know, that was it. We were the only ones that had it. But then the Russians suddenly had it, and French, and English. It's a matter of just, it's technology. And it, it can go forward in any country. Well, usually when they would have a uh, nuclear test in the Pacific or at Nevada, uh, it was in the papers. The government would announce, the Atomic Energy Commission those days would announce they're going to conduct some tests in the Pacific at Inuitok or in the Marshall Islands, usually they would say, same thing in Nevada. And uh, after the test, a lot of times they would release pictures of the detonation after it was over, when it was a nice pretty picture stage. So those got released so the public knew what was going on, but only that there were tests going on. The same thing our families knew we were there and photographing tests, but they didn't know any particular things about the tests themselves. For what answers are found within a seemingly insignificant building, what happens behind the wire fences, what a man carries home with him, and for security's sake will not speak of, these things are vital to Americans everywhere. If you were driving from Los Angeles to Salt Lake City on U.S. Highway 91, you'd pass through St. George, Utah, population 4,562, just a short way from the state line of Nevada. It's pre-dawn, five in the morning. Pretty deserted at this hour. Everything is closed down, everyone's asleep. Everyone, that is, except a milkman. Been delivering over the same route for 12 years. Never missed a day. And the police officer patrols the lonely downtown beat. And another night owl keeps his place open 24 hours for tourists coming through. Since the rest of the town was sound asleep, only our night owl saw it, that great flash in the western sky. An atomic bomb at the Nevada test site 140 miles to the west. But it's old stuff to St. George. Routine. They've seen a lot of them ever since 1951. Nothing to get excited about anymore. USA. This is the valley where the giant mushrooms grow. More atomic bombs have been exploded on these few hundred square miles of desert than on any other spot on the globe. Little bomb. Big bomb. and high bursts. I know the first one is one you'll always remember. It was in Nevada. It was a reasonably small device, and uh, it was just before dawn, so we see the light go off and you're so busy watching the light the first time and you forget about looking for the shock wave and the shock waves that comes across the desert when the hits you just a big bang and dust rises up in the air and uh, you remember that one and from then on you know it's coming so there's no problem the thing that surprised me because i had never witnessed one in person before that one was that you got a, an intense flash of heat for just a moment and it was the heat from the explosion, and it traveled through the air. Of course, light travels the fastest, so you saw the flash and the bomb and the fireball, and then you felt the heat. And it was sometime after that, really, that the shock wave arrived, and, and you felt it in the airplane. And it wasn't a shock wave that shook you completely. It was just the airplane just sort of slid sideways. But by that time, the fireball was you know, way up and disappeared. There was no more fire in the sky. Normally, at Mercury, Nevada, we were about four miles was the closest we would get. 
to stand in the open and photograph them. We used to put cameras in steel containers much closer and run them remotely. Maybe sometimes we could go a little closer if it was a small yield weapon. The smaller the weapon, the closer you get. I guess I was a, a couple of miles. I wasn't in the, uh, I think the troops I had in the, on Tumbler Snapper were like a mile and a half. Then I was about two miles back. I had some remote cameras in that area. You have to document everything. You know, if you don't, you try to go back and remember uh, what did we do here, or was this on the left or the right side? And the uh, same way you set up a building and then blow it apart, you want to see what's being done and uh, where the building is affected or whatever you're testing. How is the stress applied to it? While the shape drops, Every aspect of its performance is captured for later evaluation in the laboratory. The second test I went on in 1951, where uh, <laughs> Our writer <laughs> talked to the commander of the test and uh, was saying what kind of good shots we can make. And, and uh, he said, well, why, why can't we have an airplane follow behind the drop airplane? And the following airplane will be directly over the blast when it goes off. So then the boss said to me, he said, I got a good job for you. He said, you get in the nose of that airplane and take a picture of that bomb from right above it. So. I did that four times, and the first time, <laughs> they'd say bombs away, okay, and then they give you a count of how long it's going to be before the bomb goes off. And you wear a pair of big goggles that were a rubber frame with an almost opaque lens in it. And I thought, well, I got to keep steering the camera because the airplane's moving around. And I said, well, I'll wait till minus one, and then I'll put on my goggles. And so the count gets down to about three, and I reach up, and, and uh, it goes to two, and I go to one, and I rip the lens right out of the goggles. <laughs> it was a plastic lens. The panic set in, and I slapped my hand over my eyes, and when the flash went off, I could see the bones in my fingers. <laughs> One afternoon, I was at Lookout Mountain, right here in Hollywood, and I got a call from a uh, Woody Mark. I think he was a major at that time, and he was in Nevada. And he said, George, I need you out here tomorrow for a special test. And so he said, uh, you know, catch a plane and come on out. So I did. I got there that night. And uh, Woody said, uh, tomorrow morning, you're going to go out with five other guys, and you're going to be standing at ground zero. I said, ground zero? He said, yeah, but the bomb's going to go off 10,000 feet above you. I said, well, what kind of protective gear am I going to have? Well, he said, none. So I, I, ha I remember I had a, a, a hat, and so it was a baseball hat, so I wore that just in case. But anyway, uh, he gave me a still camera, two motion picture cameras. These were IMOs, 35 millimeter IMOs. And he says, I want you to get coverage when the things go, goes off. And so I set up the two IMOs. And I had little trip wires that I could trip it with my, my foot, you know, s starting at about five seconds before the blast. And the still camera, I also had a trip wire that I could trip it. I could get one exposure only. But anyway, these five were scientists, and they volunteered to do so, but I wasn't a volunteer. Uh, I didn't find out until I got there. But anyway, we went out there the early morning, and uh, sure enough, the tests went off on schedule.
bomb went off at 10,000 feet. We were told not to look up when the bomb, bomb goes off, but you can look up afterwards. When the bomb went off, I could see the, the ground light up. And afterwards, I looked up, and uh, you could see the donut-shaped cloud where the bomb went off. Five military observers stood directly beneath the burst, indicating the safety of interceptor nuclear rocketry to personnel on the ground below. It was on the uh, first and only firing of the 280-millimeter Army cannon, uh, firing a shell, a live atomic shell, in Frenchman's Flat, Nevada. And uh, when it went off at, I believe, about 500 feet above the ground, it appeared to have a double fireball. And that's the only one at Lookout that we've ever seen uh, before or since. Seen here for the first time is original cinemascope photography of the detonation from the atomic cannon. The image has been letterbox formatted for your television screen. Lookout Mountain tested many technical innovations including 3D photography, stereophonic sound, and vista vision, often taking the lead in the latest advances in filmmaking. The day of the test and the test itself, it's a very technical operation. They have their cameras and their film, and they're in, they don't pick their location. They might suggest to the person in charge of the whole operation where they want to be, and if it's safe for them to be there and okay for them to be there, they're there. But uh, they're all, on, all connected with uh, information, intercoms and so on. They know what, what time is, uh, is gonna be you know, the test time and they're rolling for that and uh, hopefully uh, everything works out all right. I mean, no one directs an atomic bomb going off. Once somebody pushes the button, you know, it's out of control. Attention, please. Minus 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. several of my relatives that were that died at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and so I knew how how terrible it can be in, uh, when one of these goes off and so uh, I had some of that foreknowledge I had an uncle and an aunt uh, who, who was at Nagasaki I think they came into town that day for shopping or something and uh, but they lived out in the country so if they stayed where they were at uh, where they lived they would probably have been okay but coming into town is just happened to be uh, unfortunate. I remember one test in Nevada where they brought in some pigs and, and monkeys and they propped them up, they had their eyes open and so forth. And I thought, uh, this is how people, human beings must have felt when, when the bomb went off uh, to have suffered. In the beginning, we are told, a voice spoke out in the endless depths of space to say, let there be light. Constantly and always since that day, the visible light which flashes between the stars has been paced by a powerful twin. 
the unseen glow of radioactivity produced by the monstrous nuclear furnaces, which are those stars. They issue bursting floods of radiation and showers of particles too tiny to be matter as we conceive it. Radiation and particles which flash through all space until they strike other matter. And in their striking, they alter that matter and create still new flares of radioactivity. Dead asteroids, suns, moons, or green planets. All matter in space receives this constant rain of radioactivity. So radioactivity is no new thing on Earth. Returning after each mission, the photo crews were monitored to make certain that neither they nor their equipment had been exposed to dangerous fission products. You can be damaged by radiation, but all these people were, that were out there were, you know, hopefully put in safe areas and, uh, and precautions were taken so they wouldn't be uh, overexposed to uh, too much radiation. If you're going into a radioactive area after a shot, well, then you have uh, coveralls and uh, booties to fit over your shoes, and they were taped, uh, your ankles were taped, your wrists were taped, and you had a, a cap on and a breathing mask and gloves. You'd go in there just for a minimum amount of time to collect some sample and then get out of there. And you were allowed so many uh, Middle Americans, and that was it. At the site, radiological safety teams monitor the radiation level. Scientists recover instruments that have recorded what you might call the fingerprints of nuclear fission. In the nuclear test zone, everyone had a film badge that he wore all the time. It was processed maybe once a week. When you were going to enter an area that was hazardous after a test, they issued you a separate brand new film badge. When you turn the badge in to the rad save people, they would process the film and then read it on a densitometer to determine how much radiation you had actually received. I mean, I think that people talked about how many Röntgens they got that day or Röntgens they had here or there, but I don't think that nobody ever reached the critical point. Somebody was telling me the other day that there were probably 300 and some odd that were in the atmosphere. And I missed the first five that went off was crossroads and sandstone. And then I missed uh, several others because <clears throat> when you got too much radiation for that year, they sent you home. And I don't know how many times I was sent home, and I don't know how many weapons I missed, but I would say I probably saw 80% of them. But let's interrupt such an unforgettable tableau and first discover what went on behind the scenes. Let's examine the planning and the preparation that made such a film record possible. Here in the immediate foreground was one of the 75-foot photo towers set up for Operation Sandstone at the Atomic Energy Commission's new proving grounds at Eniwetok Atoll. This tower was part of elaborate photographic instrumentation to record the detonation of three newly designed and greatly improved atomic weapons. Within the compartment of the tower are the banks of Fastax cameras. These were standard motion picture cameras to produce documentary footage in black and white and in color at both normal and advanced speeds. This O'Brien camera achieved ultra high speeds through use of an image dissector and a film drum whirling inside. This camera was capable of making 15 million pictures a second. At Lookout Mountain, the camera department had a variety of cameras, both 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter. We had 16 Mitchell cameras. We had the 35 millimeter IMO, and from that, we went to the 35 millimeter Mitchell high speed and the BNC blimp noiseless camera for studio work. <laughs> Nearly every type of airplane which carries armament, flying with the pilot or gunner, and seeing what he sees when he aims his guns, is a third eye, the lens of the Army-Navy gun camera. This camera records permanently the split seconds of gunfire during training or combat. The gun sight aiming point camera, referred to as a GASAP, 
was developed just before World War II. It was a 16 millimeter camera that had a 50 foot film magazine. It was mounted usually in the wings of an airplane and was hooked up to operate when the pilot pulled a trigger. In nuclear weapons testing, the SAP camera was used quite widely because they were small, lightweight, could run at 64 frames a second. They had their own motor, so you could set it up and uh, trigger them electrically, and they, they turned out good footage if you put in better lenses. And the gunsight aiming point camera would be no more than maybe a mile away from the, from the blast. And uh, it took pictures of buildings coming apart and houses coming apart. And uh, when the blast was too strong, it just lifted the camera off its mount, and the camera kept taking pictures. Probably the biggest challenge was what kind of exposure do you use? But really, you, whatever exposure you use, you're going to be OK, because the light intensity goes way up, and then it gradually diminishes. So whatever you, your exposure is, it's going to be OK, because somewhere in there, it's going to be correct. We had people at Lookout Mountain who were very, very innovative in developing camera platforms and different kinds of equipment, unique equipment, uh, for the atomic test. The difficulties in obtaining this type of air-to-air -air footage led to the development of a more sophisticated camera housing, adaptable to several supersonic aircraft, allowing our technicians to use a variety of cameras without additional modifications to the aircraft or camera pod. Here is a sample of the type of footage being obtained. Like all good cameramen, ours do almost anything and go anywhere to get the shots they need. The EG and g did all the instrumentation work, and we did the documentary work. And in addition, they made training films of different nuclear natures, how to load a bomb, and things like this. Mostly the analytical type film was shot by a, an organization called EGG, and they did all the super high speed stuff with, the, with timing and everything. Technical photography on most atomic and nuclear tests was handled by a company called EG&G, or Edgerton, Germishausen, and Greer. EG&G was founded by Harold Edgerton, a pioneer photographer and father of the photographic strobe light. Alumni of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Edgerton, Germishausen, and Greer were responsible for the many hundreds of cameras which provided the technical and analytical photography, as well as providing the timing and firing circuits which set off the bombs. Charles Wyckoff, a member of the EG&G team, made valuable contributions to the creation of new cameras and film stocks to record the atomic blasts. In cooperation with the Eastman Kodak Company, Wyckoff developed a special black and white film which was resistant to the dangerous gamma rays of an atomic blast. The principle behind the XR film is two, twofold. First of all, you've got several different emulsions of different speeds all put together, one on top of the other. And uh, when you develop it, of course, the density becomes very, very high. So in order to get away from that heavy density, uh, I introduce color into the film, in, into each layer. And of course, color is a transparent thing. It's clear, it doesn't diffuse. And so uh, you can make the arrangement anything you want, but in XR film, I happened to make the first layer, the most sensitive layer, as a yellow image, and the intermediate sensitive layer as a magenta image, and the slowest layer as a blue image. And we learned a lot from this emulsion. In fact, Kodak learned a lot from it. And so later on, when, uh, when uh, NASA was getting ready to go to the moon, they had me develop a color film for them for the moon landing, which was really based upon this, this principle. In fact, all of the modern day color films are now based on this principle. To further screen certain instruments from radiation, lead bricks are brought into the timing station and placed by Tommy Thompson of NRL. The EG&G staff played an important part in the development of these high-speed recording oscilloscopes to be used in several experiments. 
Equipment centers in 36-inch Navy searchlights modified to meet scientific requirements. Eberhard and Doc Edgerton make final checks. A special camera called the Rapidtronic was developed at EGNG to photograph the initial burst of energy in the first millionth of a second. Six cameras simultaneously captured the progression of the fireball as it vaporized the tower. Here, these images are combined to give the impression of motion. The, the cameras were mounted on racks uh, up on top of a 300-foot tower in a cab. And so uh, usually in each tower we had six cameras. And uh, they were stacked one on top of the other. And this is so precise that we can have two cameras sitting side by side or 600 meters apart and have them go off within a millionth of a second of each other. And that way we can make these diameter measurements to make the uh, efficiency measurements. Have you ever seen a river of molten lava? Or the catch of an Agena capsule high above the Pacific Ocean? We have them all on film. This was the only self-contained studio, so to speak, but they had many detachments or squadrons around the country that did work for the Air Force, did documentary work for the Air Force or whatever was required of them. And their film was processed at various labs near their area. Like there was one, there was a, squad, a detachment of the unit that I was with at Lookout Mountain was at Vandenberg Air Force Base. There was another one in Honolulu and there was one in Colorado Springs. A blend of precision flying by the United States Air Force Thunderbirds and the peoples of the Far East produced an Academy Award nominee called Breaking the Language Barrier. There were detachments around the country to cover different projects for the Air Force. We used to go and photograph the uh, Thunderbirds Air Force demonstration team. They'd gone on and put on air shows, so we'd photograph that. Here's a typical camera crew at work shooting scenes of an atlas. The 1352nd Motion Picture Squadron Detachment 2 was headquartered at Colorado Springs, Colorado at the Air Force Academy. And they handled photographing all of the missile silos in the uh, central part of the US. During joint exercises like Desert Strike and Polar Siege, photographic personnel are deployed and work closely with units in the field to obtain documentary and record photography. It was at the Holloman test track where we photographed this chimp's preparation and test for the accelerated G's with which man has moved out into space. Using a special mount developed at Lookout Mountain, we recorded his high-speed run on this test sled. At times, cameras are run at high speed to record spectacular events like this napalm attack on a simulated Cuban Missile Guidance Control Van. The result? Slow motion photography for operational analysis personnel of the Tactical Air Command. Here it is at normal speed. Seven hundred pounds of napalm per tank. Well, uh, there, there were so many of them that were spectacular, but the, the one that I remember was the very first thermonuclear one 
that Dr. Teller was just running a test on before it was really a bomb, but it was a thermonuclear device, and, and uh, I think that was probably the most spectacular one I remember. in the Pacific, we would sometimes be as far as 20 miles. However, there were uh, some of the last big thermonuclear weapons that went off. Uh, I was photographing uh, B-57s flying as close as they could, was four miles, and then we'd have to turn and fly away from it as rapidly as possible so that when the shock wave got us, it wouldn't hit us broadside, would hit us tail on it give us a shove. The only one time I was leery was on a, uh, a device was tested in Bikini Atoll and at that time I was installing remote cameras operated by radio control on the island and I would load the film in the camera, uh, close it up and get a helicopter ride out out of the lagoon into an aircraft carrier where I'd stay there overnight and then the next morning you'd come back in after the shot and recover the film. It got later and later and the helicopter didn't show up to pick me up and the guy that was working with me and I thought well I don't want to stay here all night because it's going to be 4.30 comes around pretty quick, and they're on a roster. So they should know I'm missing, but maybe they didn't. They have a roll call every time before to account for everybody, and if they went through the roll call and my name wasn't, and I didn't answer the roll call, they would cancel the shot until I was found. So it was pretty safe. But still, you don't know that that guy hasn't crossed my name off and left somebody else's on or something. So. We will now examine the Wahoo and Umbrella studies on visible surface phenomena, the dimensions and extent of spray dome, base surge, and water waves. I believe Wahoo and Umbrella were the first two underwater shots that I ever observed close up. It was more amazing in some ways than an above ground nuclear shot. The rockets were set up at various angles and fired before the shot so that by the time they reached surface zero area, they were staggered at different elevations. So when the shock wave came up through the water, uh, they could tell how long it was for the uh, shock wave to hit a certain rocket trail, which gave them the uh, propagation rate of the, uh, of the shock wave. I was about uh, two and a half miles from them the rockets went off and then suddenly this gigantic column of water shot straight up into the air and you're watching the waves come closer and closer to the ship and at two and a half miles it's hard to judge how far away it was from surface zero but suddenly the waves just washed over the ship and uh, you could then see how gigantic the height of that uh, wave was. After the shot, it seemed to be a couple of minutes or so before the first wave came in, not very high, and up to that time, the water had been quite calm at the beach, then the first wave came in, then receded. The second wave came in and a little higher and uh, also retreated, and the third wave came in was the highest and completely covered the island, about four to six feet high, and uh, after about uh, 10 minutes, the water subsided, we could get down out of the tree. And a few minutes later, a light plane from Inuitok came over, throttled back his engines, and hollered, are you all right down there? So we waved that we were in good shape, so off he flew. Most of the times in the Pacific, they would send the footage. We had a courier, would carry it in, get it processed, bring it back to us so we could see it and see what we were doing right or wrong. 
because we were usually out there three months, you know, sometimes longer. On the last test, it seems to me, uh, it took us almost eight months because we were doing high altitude shots in the stratosphere to see what the effects would be of an atomic blast at super high altitude. And they blew up, one of the, one of the missiles blew up on the pad and then we had to repair the pad and then we had to go, all go back out there and months later and do it again. Lots of times on these tests, they'd, the film would come in and we'd work around the clock processing it, taking a quick check to see it looked all okay, and giving it to a courier to go right back out to the, uh, to the test area. The most spectacular were in the Pacific, these hydrogen bombs. They normally went off right at sunup or just before it, the sky started getting light. And uh, you had to look away at, at the initial blast, but as you look to it afterwards, you could see the mushroom cloud developing, and you could see this eerie ultraviolet glow in the cloud. And I thought that was so, so spectacular, so meaningful in terms of how powerful that bomb was, that uh, I still picture that vividly in my mind. Well, I think a lot of us felt that uh, th what we were doing was very important to capture the imagery of, of these atomic uh, tests and, and devices. And it, it could be do going down in history that it could be preserved and, and so people could see what some of the terrible things that it can do or cannot do. I think that things take a natural course and they're going to happen anyway. You know, I think that Truman was absolutely right in using the bomb. It ended the war. I think it saved a lot of lives, not only people from our country, but people from other countries, Japan as well. And it did end the war. It was, it was a horrible thing. The only thing is, you know, could he have asked her to drop a bomb 20 miles off the coast of Tokyo and tell the emperor to look out his window at that time and see what happens? They didn't do that, but... Uh, it, it brought the, the war to an end. N knowing how, how dangerous it could have been, uh, there's no need to take that kind of a chance, certainly you know, now at my age. Things have changed since then. You know, it's, uh, what, 50 years later. And who knows what, what will be our next problem. You don't know. You, know. you don't have control of your life. So you never know what's going to come out. After all, Vietnam turned out to be a you know, bigger... Uh, problem for the country and that the happy and unhappy people is than uh, the atomic bombs were. I think it's very important, yes, to, to preserve the, the, the records. But as far as additional testing, I think that uh, what we're doing is right, uh, that there should be a ban on further testing. I communicate still with quite a few of the, uh, the people there uh, from Lagan Mountain. I, I think we were like a family, definitely.